Well, welcome back. Now we're starting Lecture 7, which is Radar, Clutter, and Chaff, and it's Lecture 7 in the Introduction to Radar Systems course. Okay, back again to the radar block diagram. Uh, you see here at the antenna and uh, emitting radiation and receiving back some backscatter. Well, what is radar clutter? We see where you've got a target out there, an aircraft, and it has a target cross-section, and an echo will come back from that. But there are an awful lot of other objects out in the environment that the radar's beam will intersect, interact with, scatter off of, and radiation will come back, backscatter will come back to the antenna, and it will be received by the radar. And all this unwanted backscatter from real physical objects out there in the environment are what we call radar clutter. In this cartoon, we see that we've just got some buildings noted. One of the forms is backscatter from the ground. So let's look in detail at what all the different kinds of radar clutter are. Okay, well, why study radar clutter? Well, when people built the first radars, they found that not only did they get back echoes from the target of interest, that's what we want, but they also, of course, got rece received, received receiver noise. There was noise from the atmosphere. And then, if other radars were operating nearby, cooperative radars that might be from a nearby airport if, uh, or mil other military radars nearby, uh, you could get interference from those radars, unwanted man-made electromagnetic interference. And also jammers. Um, if you were operating in a wartime environment in order to degrade your radar, the enemy might turn on large noise jammers to degrade the performance of your radar. Because if you remember earlier, the radar echoes that we're looking for are very, very weak. And so if you could raise the noise floor, the uh, targets would be well above that, noise, uh, well below the noise level with the jammers. But these, are, these, these kinds of noise issues aren't what we're going to be talking about today. Today we're going to be talking about backscatter from unwanted objects, backscatter from the ground, sea, rain, chaff, birds, and ground traffic. Now this cartoon of a naval air defense scenario shows quite vividly um, in a pictorial way how all these different uh, backscatter entities can come into play. Uh, say we have a radar located on a ship and uh, uh, the ship can be located near land, we call the littoral environment, and it, it could, uh, along with detecting aircraft or say a, a missile over in this direction, uh, the beams as they scan back and forth can see targets uh, that are made up of ground, hill, hilly areas, uh, grassy areas, or buildings. So quite first thing we're noticing is the ground can be quite different in the backscatter that it presents. Uh, if, it, if you're operating uh, on a ship, certainly some backscatter will come with your, your low elevation beams will come from the sea. Uh, if you are a, uh, a land-based radar and you're lo located near the water, you can also get sea returns, backscatter returns from the sea. And we all know that it rains sometimes, and rain is made up of little droplets of water. And when you have lots of them, rain coming down, a, you know, half an inch an hour, quarter of an inch an hour, there's enough of it within the radar's volume that it can do quite a devastating uh, effect on radars, as we'll see when we look at the characteristics of rain backscatter. And then there's chaff. Uh, developed during World War II, it consists of uh, uh, dipoles, which are half wavelength long pieces of aluminum or aluminized mylar, and these and the, the the length of the dipole is tuned. That is to say, it's uh, set so the wavelength uh, of the dipole, its half wavelength corresponds to the radar that it wants to inundate and do damage to. Uh, 
and during World War II, uh, bombers would have big cartons of aluminized mo uh, aluminum foil that they would throw out the windows and uh, to confuse uh, radars. In fact, there were German radars when the Allies were bombing uh, Germany from Great Britain. Um, and then there were also birds. And this sometimes can be a, people say birds, a chuckle factor, you know. But in fact, and we'll show in detail a little later, uh, small objects uh, like birds, particularly when there are, um, there can be hundreds of thousands of them during migration times within the coverage of the radar. By the end of this briefing, you won't think it's a chuckle factor. And particularly with the advent of, uh, uh, people in the military environment making uh, aircraft cross sections that are smaller and smaller than clutter, which whose an eight cross section is smaller and is small, comes into play more. And then there's ground traffic. Well, you might say, well, gee, how can ground traffic be a really big problem? Well, you might be a radar that's uh, located uh, in a relatively flat area and a few miles, five, five, ten miles away, there might be uh, a hilly area that an interstate highway goes over. And every couple of seconds, or, or an interstate winds along the top of a, of a hilly ridge. Uh, those um, automobiles will have a significant cross-section, and also they'll be moving. So they'll have a Doppler frequency that can mimic the Doppler frequency of a small Cherokee, Piper Cherokee flying around in your coverage. Uh, because uh, Piper Cherokees, although they go 100, 150 miles an hour, they're not always going straight towards you. They can be going tangentially or roughly tangentially, and they can have low radial velocity. So all these different objects come into play. And now what we're going to do is we're going to look at each one of these objects one at a time. And the reason we're spending a whole lecture on radar clutter is to understand the problem. Because this is lecture seven. Lecture eight is solving the problem with the Doppler print processing. So first, in order to solve a problem, you just have to understand the nature of the problem. And so what we're going to do is go understand the nature and the characteristics of each of these different effects. Okay, let's first start with ground clutter, backscatter from the ground. Okay. And if I only had two sentences to say about ground clutter, um, uh, I'd say it's large and it doesn't have a very big Doppler, but it can have a Doppler. And let's go over what, a little bit more what I mean by that. Uh, we characterize ground clutter by its mean backscatter. Okay. And as I just mentioned, uh, the backscatter from the ground, uh, it can be very, very large relative to an aircraft. It can be 10 or 100,000 times larger than the aircraft that you want to detect. So we're going to have to use some other principle, and I've alluded to the Doppler principle, as a means of, of seeing aircraft in the presence of this very large, uh, uh, relatively stationary, um, uh, backscatter. Uh, and I say relatively stationary, I don't mean that the ground moves for ground-based radars, but you'll see a little later if the radar is moving because it's on a ship or an aircraft, then the ground clutter does move relative to the radar. And that makes a difference. The next point about the uh, ground clutter is that the backscatter that you get varies an awful lot. And the best way to characterize this is to do it statistically. Because um, uh, it, it, you just can't make a deterministic, a simple deterministic model of where the ground clutter will be. It's not an easy thing to do. And ground clutter varies with the frequency of the radiation that the radar is emitting. It varies with the spatial resolution of the radar. If you're looking at a big patch of the ground with a big resolution cell in space and range and azimuth, you're going to see more backscatter. It varies with the geometry, how the radar is set up 
relative to the geometry of the ground. Um, if you're uh, on a hill and looking down into a, uh, a valley region, uh, you're going to get a higher backscatter from the ground than if you're in a, a grassy plain of Kansas and for the most part the, the ground's clutter you see is going to be at a very slight grazing angle. And it's going to depend an awful lot on terrain type. You can imagine the backscatter from buildings which have a man-made objects which have a, a, a perpendicular aspect to the radar beam that's going to have a higher cross-section than, as I just said, flatlands of Kansas or a hilly uh, terrain or mountainous terrain like the Rocky Mountains. Now, I alluded a little bit earlier to the Doppler characteristics of ground clutter. You might say, ground clutter, hmm, if you're on the ground, it doesn't move. Well, trees are on the ground, and trees do have some conductivity and they move back and forth with the wind so that there will be a spread to the Doppler, a spread to the radio velocity distribution when that we look at the Doppler distribution of the echoes coming back from the ground. It's only a few knots. It's only a few knots. Now, one class of antennas, if you've ever been out to an airport and you've seen an antenna go around and around, they go around at 12 RPM about once every five seconds, now just imagine, say, 10 miles away from that radar, there's a big, a big chimney from a power plant. And as the radar goes by that chimney, it's emitting pulses. And a typical air traffic control radar will emit pulses approximately 1,000 times a second. And so that impinging upon that tower will be about 20 pulses. S the, the pulses in the middle of the 20, around 10 or 11, the antenna will be pointed exactly at the tower. And the ones near 1, 2, 3, or 18, 19, 20 pulses, the, the antenna is going to be off to the side, and the beam pattern of the antenna is going to be down a lot. What that does is that um, modulates, we call it. It varies the backscatter due to that tower as a function of time as we scan past the tower. And that amplitude modulation of the echoes that we process will convert into the Doppler frequency domain into a spread, a Doppler spread. Now, I mentioned that the innate Doppler spread of, say, trees is a few knots. Well, that chimney, which doesn't move at all, when it has an antenna scanning by it at 12 RPM, that in, you see a spread of 12 knots, of 10 to 12 knots. Okay? And, uh, and this is at S band, and I'm picking numbers from history. So that you can have a Doppler spread to ground clutter, which doesn't move because of that mechanical scanning of the antenna. Now, the other area which gives ground clutter uh, a Doppler shift when you illuminate it is if the, and the um, radar is not on the ground. The, it can be on a ship or on an aircraft. And what the Doppler effect measures is the relative vo radial velocity relative to the radar. So if the radar is moving at 30 knots, it's 10 miles offshore, and it's looking at a building, and the ship is leaving port, that Doppler shift is going to be 30 knots for the buildings, the ground clutter. And the radar processing has to accommodate that those differences, those shifts. Of course, if you're on an aircraft and you're moving Mach 1, the clutter can be all over the place. And we'll see later when we look at airborne radars that um, the, the complexity of ground clutter in an airborne radar environment. We're only going to spend a few uh, minutes on the clutter with airborne radars and those effects. Uh, a solid treatment of the subject takes a couple of lectures just of airborne radars and the clutter issues. It uh, uh, takes a, a, a good couple of lectures to do really right. But, but for this introductory course, we're just going to introduce you to the subject. Now let's look 
at what when we really look at ground clutter, what is it? What does it look like? Okay. And the basic radar display that operators had used for years and years, now everything's digital. But the basic radar display that people would use is a display called a, a plane position indicator, or PPI. And it, just imagine you're way above the radar, you know, 10, 20, 30, 10, 20, 30 miles up, and you're looking down at the ground. And the radar beam is going out in one direction and it's rotating around, rotating around. And say you take a picture of the, all the radar returns from a, a revolution of the radar. And you, you, the way you set up your thresholding is that uh, you set a threshold up that's just above the noise level of, of return, just above the noise return. And so, and, and, th and what you see as white are targets that you see, all kinds of targets. Targets from the aircraft, targets from the ground, from the uh, rain, from chaff, from everything. Okay? And so that the operators could tell the relative range, they artificially put on these displays rings, which are called range rings. And this data that I'm showing you right here is very heavy ground clutter. It's taken from a mountainous region of Ontario, Canada, and the PPI display is set for 30 miles. And you can see, well, it's hardly, it's not quite visible in this photograph. Uh, the, there's a 10-mile range ring here, a 20-mile range ring, and a 30-mile. And here we see stars at the edge of the display. Now, the areas in white are the areas above the minimum detectable signal of the radar. And you can see that out to 20 miles, the screen is completely white. There's backscatter in this mountainous region from the ground everywhere. And it's impossible to see an aircraft in that region because the ground clutter dominates, dominates in size, the, return, the backscatter return. And to see just how big this is, what we can do is we can put an attenuator in the receiver path that attenuates this signal. And if we put an attenuator in that cuts down that signal to one millionth, 60 dB power down, one millionth, we still see backscatter return. We still see backscatter return. This is a very, this is, this is not your average clutter. In fact, I picked it as an example of a very, very, very heavy clutter return area, just to show you how devastating ground clutter can be if we didn't have techniques to handle it, which we'll talk about in the next lecture. Okay, now to show you, as we slowly peel that onion between uh, 0 and 50 dB, this is a series of PPI displays uh, that go out, let's see, I know th I know this is, see, I know that's about 12, this is 10 miles, 20, 30, this is about 40 miles out, okay? So with no attenuation, this is what one sees. Notice this central area, it, it blooms like a bright light bulb. And that's because these analog displays that people used early on before we had digital displays, the, the phosphorus has a natural dynamic range of about 20 dB. So uh, you can only see with real detailed resolution uh, the backscatter in a 20 dB region. Okay? And um, so that here is with zero attenuation. And I want to point out that this is uh, an air traffic control radar at S-band that's located at the Burlington, Vermont airport. And there are two things to point out. This is backscatter from the Adirondack Mountains. And this is backscatter from a ridge line of mountains. It's very intense. That It's about 12, 13 miles away from the 14 miles away from the radar. I believe, I seem to remember. The order of 10 to 15 miles away. And you can see and it's at two and a half, the beam width is at two and a half degree elevation angle. And so as we put in a factor of 10 in attenuation, 
we start to reduce the clutter. And then 20 dB of attenuation. So even after putting in a factor of 1,000 in attenuation, the pieces of the Adirondack still break through. We still see detections. And we still see that intense ridge line uh, about 15 mi 10 or 15 miles from the radar. This is probably a 10 mile range ring, and that's, that's about 12 miles. Um, and then you can see, in order to get rid of the clutter, you have to put in a factor of 100,000 in attenuation. So what that says is that that clutter is 100,000 times greater than the um, minimum detectable signal of the radar. That's pretty intense. Now let's try to put some numbers with this and go over, uh, give you a geometric and analytical feel for what's going on. So let's look at the geometry of how we see radar clutter. This is in the, in the height dimension, this is slightly exaggerated. Uh, a radar typically, and I, uh, a radar that's ground based will probably have a height of about, uh, you know, 50 feet, 30 feet, 50 feet, 100 feet, and it's the height is chosen depending upon the ter local terrain. But there's a height involved, and uh, the antenna will be here, and it's illuminating the ground. And each pulse illuminates a piece of the ground, and the the length, the pulse length of the uh, that the, the pulse illuminates, the length of ground that illuminates is CT over 2 with a trigonometric factor C. Uh, it's really a cosine on the bottom, cosine of this uh, depression angle. The radar is pointing down to see the ground and uh, and that length, C one half CT times the secant of phi is the length of the radar resolution cell. Typically this angle is very close to zero so the secant is very close to one. This is a very small effect. And later on when I do a sample calculation I just assume it's one. Now when we look vertically down at the radar we have the beam width of the radar which is I call theta sub b and we're looking out at some range and so this cross range is just the range times the beam width in radians. Remember there are two pi radians in a circle, 100, 360 degrees. So you just take the radians, multiply it by, um, uh, well if you were just dealing with degrees you multiply it by pi divided by 180 and you get radians. So this area we're interested in where the clutter is located is just the, the cross range times the down range range and it, so it would be R times the beam width R being the range to the clutter patch times one half CT with the secant th uh, phi uh, thrown in. And down here we see a little uh, equation that the uh, cross section, we call this the uh, backscatter coefficient it's sigma zero. Now I looked up and uh, I noticed uh, in a first take of this view of these uh, talks, um, half the view graphs had a subscript and half had a superscript. So I went back to the textbooks and half the textbooks use a superscript and half use a subscript. So I scratched my head and, and rather than um, changing to make them all the same, which would be changing the notation of one of the authors for another one. I'll just let's say it up front. Uh, super script, subscript. If you go to one book, you'll see one thing. You go to another book, you'll see another. And uh, anyway, sigma with a zero, either super or subscript, is the cross section that's measured in meters squared, if you remember back from the radar equation, per unit area. Now why do we make this attribute that we're going to use to characterize backscatter from the ground, why do we measure it as a cross-section per unit area? Because if we had double the area, we'd have probably double the cross-section, pretty much, you know?
So we measure the cross-section uh, by a parameter that's uh, the actual cross-section per unit area. We use that to characterize the backscatter from a certain type of terrain at a certain frequency or whatever. Okay, And that area is what would go down there. And so if we actually measured with a radar a cross-section, we'd divide it by the area, and then we'd say, aha, it has a sigma zero of a certain amount. Now, the question is, what is the sigma zero everywhere? The next view graph after this one is going to go in, and we're going to discuss that. But first, what I'd like to do is let's just assume a typical value of minus 20 dB. That and what we're going to do is we're going to look and see just how big uh, the clutter is relative to a target. And we're going to go through its uh, calculation. So the cross-section of the clutter, as I said, is this cross-section uh, per unit area times the area. And uh, here you can see I've gotten rid of the secant phi by assuming that phi is 0, so the secant of phi is 1 so that uh, this is the area that's illuminated, CT over 2 times R theta. And let's just look and see what it is for an airport surveillance radar. Oh, 60 kilometers, you know, away from the radar. And uh, so an airport surveillance radar has a range cell of about 100 meters, okay? And we're going to assume 60 kilometers, so that's 60,000 meters. And the beam width of an airport surveillance radar is actually it's a little bit less for the convenience in going through the numbers. I put in, it's about, about a degree and a half order of magnitude. And that's 0.026 radians when you multiply that times pi, 3.14159, divided by 180, you get 0.026 radians. And then you put all these numbers in together, multiply them all out, and we get the cross section of the clutter to be 1,500 meters squared, okay? Now, if uh, you're flying around in a pipe of Cherokee, a small single-engine aircraft, uh, your cross-section nose-on is about one meter squared. So that the size of the target, order of magnitude, is one over 1,500. Well, no wonder in that very heavy clutter environment, you'd never see a small target in that environment because the target is le much less than a thousandth the size. Now, in order to see the target well, and back earlier uh, when we talked about in detection, we talked that for good detection, you'd like to have a signal-to-noise ratio of about 13 dB uh, for a probability of false alarm of 10 to the minus 6 if it's a steady target. So and that 13 dB is 20 in natural units. I take 10 times the logarithm to the base 10 of 20, I'll get 13, so that's the 13 dB. So for good detection you'd like that ratio to be about 20. So we're going to have to do some processing that suppresses the clutter by this 1500 plus the factor of 20. So that you can look at this as the target to clutter ratio going into the signal processor and then we want to, and this is the target to clutter ratio, the signal to clutter ratio coming out of the signal processor. So you say for this example of an airport surveillance radar we want that number to be about 30,000 or about 45 dB. That's a big number. So you've got to do some fancy processing. To, and that's not at all as tough as other kinds of environments can be. This is a typical clutter ejection environment, but it's a, not a trivial thing you do just by snapping your fingers. Okay? Now, how do, well, we've got, we, I sort of popped in that number of sigma zero, the cross section per unit area. Um, I just popped in minus 20 dB, 0.01 meters squared of cross section per meter square. Now, uh, back in the mid 80s, there was a significant effort, effort that was undertaken at Lincoln Laboratory to measure ground clutter very, very well over a whole bunch of frequencies. 
here we see them VHF, UHF, L band going from uh, you know a meter and a half down to 0.03 meters a lot of different wavelengths and a lot of different areas and the cross section was me measured at uh, 42 sites in uh, Canada and the United States and the types of environments there was uh, you know wheat land uh, you know where there was just like the like Kansas so to speak there was desert there was uh, forested mountainous terrain you can see up in the uh, the mountainous area of Canada uh, there were all sorts of different terrains picked uh, even some data was taken uh, overlooking the sea to measure sea clutter actually which but a, a very extensive environment most of it involving land clutter was undertaken and it was archived on then if you think of the mid 80s it wasn't a few ray discs it was on gazillions of magnetic tapes and that data uh, was analyzed very very extensively uh, this fellow Barry Billingsley uh, spent a good part of his uh, career analyzing that data and uh, here we have um, this photograph is from one of his major technical reports but uh, Barry also uh, in the past few years had put out a textbook uh, not a textbook I'd say but a, a researcher's book on everything he's learned about ground clutter and man if I have a problem with ground clutter I go to Barry or his book now that he's retired and working part time. Anyway, um, and one of the things that he added to the to the uh, the body of knowledge of radar is to look at the clutter physics very carefully and look at what are the different pieces that come into play and try to break down and understand the influence of the polarization, the influence of the terrain type, the physics of what was going on, the depression angle. Uh, the frequency of the radar, the size of the resolution cells, all those different things. I'm going to in the next few graphs to show you some of those different effects. Here we see a radar up on a hill and it's emitting a beam and here's the depression angle down of one bit of energy in that be uh, say this is the center of the beam. Um, if it hits this tree area there's going to be some what we'll call micro shattering that is to say you don't see this ground clutter because the tree is in the way you don't see this piece of ground clutter because this piece of the hill is in the way so there's a shadowing effect this building shadows the land behind it and consequently behind this edge of the hill you don't see this micro shadowing so that's one area and you notice in Barry's book as opposed to other books he uses a, super, a superscript on the sigma zero for the clutter coefficient um, and let's see it also depends on the range and on the height so and the depression angle that you're looking down so these are all the so to speak the variables that come into play into how the physics of the backscatter would evolve now there are a bunch of other factors. One of them is the propagation. You can have multipath lobing, which can reinforce and uh, minimize detection at different angles. So multipath can come into play. And because multipath is dependent, and as you remember back from your um, propagation lecture, it's dependent on frequency. And so uh, multipath is something also when you measure the sigma zero you can't unfold it and the multipath and the propagation is all taken up into when we measure the clutter strength we just don't measure sigma zero uh, we measure sigma zero and a propagation factor and it's to the fourth power because of the range you know, because it's a radar you know, the, like the art of the fourth factor in sensitivity and so we have the propagation factor coming into play to uh, the now then again we have these three other general characteristics characteristics that come into play the frequency the characteristics of the radar its frequency and the spatial resolution the geometry whether you how deep, deep far down you're looking and in range height will 
play back into what is the depression angle. And then the terrain type. What kind of land cover do we have? Is it a sandy desert area? Uh, is it an urban area, forested, mountainous? So you want to break down when you collect data at all these different types. And you'd like to collect data at different frequencies with the same terrain type, different geometries with the same terrain type. You have a cursive dimensionality that you want to collect too. You like to collect all the data. You can't, so you collect too much still and break it all down later on. And if I had to take all of Barry's work, put it in one view graph, this is it. It's where he plotted, and well this is just for rural sites. It doesn't look at urban sites, it doesn't look at mountainous, but they're similar. It plots the mean of the backscatter times that propagation factor that you can't take out uh, for uh, and, he, and again, for different range resolutions and polarizations, you get a swath of mean backscatter at VHF, UHF, L band, S band, the next band. Excuse me. All of the, these are the five different frequencies that data was measured. And these are at 36 different rural sites. Now, and for these 36 different rural sites, you notice it's a band of backscatter that you get, of mean ground cloud or strength characterized by the sigma zero f to the fourth power. And what it says to me, guy who likes to design radars, if I wanted to design a radar at X band, I'd make sure I designed the radar to handle, say, a minus 18 dB sigma zero with the f thrown in you know, the F to the fourth thrown in, so that was going to operate in rural sites. So this is the the kind of ex very extensive encyclopedic data and its analysis that came out of that, and it uh, gives you a good feel of how ground clutter now can vary with all these different parameters.